Hello, it's Annabelle Beckwith here again with another Beanbag Talk. Today I am continuing to talk about stakeholders with another matrix again. I am sharing with you things that I have found very, very useful indeed in my own uh, life, work, career, whatever. A few minutes ago I recorded a short piece on the power and interest matrix when we're considering stakeholders which gives you some guidance as to where to focus your energies and your efforts when you're communicating with different stakeholders depending on their level of power and their level of interest in your project. This is another matrix that I really like and it's been devised by Peter Block. Again if you want to look it up online the Peter Block Trust Agreement Matrix you will find more information about it. So here it is. Now Whereas the power and interest matrix is very much about how you communicate with people, this is very much about how they perceive you and your project. And there's a few things going on here. Uh, again, we're working with the same sort of matrix in that here we've got the lower parameters, so somebody who doesn't trust you for whatever reason, and there might be reasons behind that, and who doesn't agree with what you're trying to do. And that the, either end, the other end of the spectrum, we have people who do trust you and do agree with you. Now, <clears throat> it's useful to sort of mentally sort people into these categories. At this end of the spectrum, somebody who doesn't trust you and they don't agree with you, this is your adversary. Um, and it's possible that for whatever reasons, uh, for whatever reasons, they might try to undermine your particular project. There's a couple of things here that's worth asking because it's very easy to judge people and think, well, they're one of those people, they're never going to agree. Ask them the question, ask somebody the question, why do they not agree with what's going on? What is it that's the stumbling block for them? Ask the question, don't make an assumption in your dealings with these people. Why do they not trust you? Now, there's a number of reasons for that. Nobody wants to feel, let's face it, that they're untrustworthy. But have you let this person down in the past? Have you said you're going to deliver something and then possibly through no fault of your own, you've not delivered? Is it that that person just doesn't know you or hasn't worked with you before, so doesn't know whether they can trust you to deliver? What might lie behind this? This whole area of trust is an entire subject area on its own that I will cover another day, but trust is going to be crucial uh, to getting things done. Um, Stephen Covey has said that trust has a business case. It does, it does. If you have trust within an organisation and a team, it lends itself to productivity and to profitability, but that's something for another day. Why don't they trust you and how might you go about building or rebuilding that trust? So before we continue, it's a key point, right? Who's your adversary? They don't agree with you, they don't trust you. Why? Find out, work on it. We also have people who don't necessarily trust you, again, for whatever reasons, but they do agree with your project and these are the bedfellows. So what do we mean by this rather old fashioned word here? Well, they're with you for a short period of time, arguably. It's not about you and their working relationship with you and the level to which they trust you. It's very much about the project and the extent to which they agree with what you're looking, uh, with what you're looking to do. But this may be enough. Maybe in the long term you don't necessarily need to build that working relationship because you're just working together on this particular project and then away you go to other priorities. But these are your bedfellows. Over here we have those people, they trust you, maybe you've worked together, maybe you've delivered above and beyond the call of duty, they trust you and they're in agreement with what you're looking to do. And these people, these people are your allies. <clears throat> One of the things to consider is how do your allies relate to any of these others in the other four boxes? Because there is every potential to leverage the influence of your allies to move some of these other people towards a more positive frame of mind regarding either you or your particular project. Can these people influence the bedfellows and say, actually, this person is a trustworthy individual, I work with them for many years, etc., etc.? 
maybe they can work with the adversary to get them to move one way or the other as well. So it's not just about you and your individual stakeholders, it's also about how your stakeholders relate to each other within your network. But we still have another one to go here. These are the people who, they do trust you, they just don't agree with you. And these are your opponents. Now, for me, it was quite an important thing to recognise that there's, there are these differences here because I would tend to see things in the past as black and white. You're either for me or you're against me. Black or white, there's one thing or the other. Uh, and I hadn't realised that there's these other things going on. Um, I might look at my opponents and think, but I thought we got on, I thought you trusted me. And yet, ask the question. Actually, it's not about you and the trust. There's something about the thing that you're looking to do that they're not in agreement with. What is it? Can you set them straight? Do they have a point that you haven't considered? Hold the conversation. Ask the open question to find out what's going on. With bedfellows, again, I, in the past, I might have been very quick to think that they were allies. Oh, they trust me. They like me. They're, they're going to come back to me. No, they were working with me for that project because they agreed with that particular project and that I was the right person for that project, moving forward not so much. Maybe there's more I need to do in order to build that trusting relationship to move them over to that particular box. We also have the fence sitters. Uh, and these people present a bit of a challenge because we don't know where they sit. If we know where they sit, we can gauge how we speak to those people, how we influence those people, what kind of questions we ask them. If we have no idea where they sit, where they sit, it can be really difficult to do that. Here's the thing, sometimes fence sitters will reveal their hand, not by what they say or what they don't say, but by what they do. So observe the outputs of their behaviors. It may be that in meetings, they're very quiet, they appear to be going on with things, are they in fact working really hard and they are actually your allies, they're just quiet allies. Are they in the background trying to sabotage your efforts somewhere? Again, it's a question of thinking of, uh, of, of, of ways in which you can ask questions that will flush them out and get them to reveal your hand, reveal their hand. Once they have, you have a better idea as to how you might influence uh, them, how you might negotiate with them and so on. Again, the reason I bring this to your attention is because it's very much about working relationships. If you're a people person, um, in terms of your social style or in terms of your disc profile or something like that, and working relationships are important to you, this will mean quite a lot. If you're more of a task orientated person and you're thinking, okay, how do I communicate? Then perhaps the power and interest matrix might be of more interest to you. However, here it is, stakeholders. Peter Block's Trust and Agreement Matrix. 